the Lord to hide us, and it means he covers us and conceals us. And we know in Psalm 91 it says that he puts his wings around us, his feathers over us. When his feathers are over us, when his wings are around us, that means we're close to his heart. Right? And here's what God's heart is. His heart for you is his love. His heart for you is his protection. His heart for you is his mercy. His heart for you is his grace. His heart for you is knowing your frame, understanding that you're human, knowing that you've got a limit, right? God, I can't take any more. Lord, I'm, I'm up to here with this or that. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And we can come in close to his heart, and he puts his arms around us and draws us in. So I don't know what you're going through today, right? Some of us are going through some stuff. Miss Bubbles, we know you're going through stuff. Kendra and her family going through stuff. Kelly, I know you guys got stuff. Penny and Anita, do you guys got stuff? Yeah, we got Always. stuff. <laughs> Always. Always. Pastor Nate, do you got any stuff? Yeah, I got stuff. <laughs> I got <laughs> stuff too. So here, let's do this this morning, okay? Imagine yourself just pulling in really close, okay? And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm not being disrespectful, but I'm like snuggle in next to God, right? Yeah. Get yourself in there next to him. Doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Doesn't matter what's going on. Okay, Lord, we come in close to you right now. God, you know our struggles. You know where we feel tempted, you know where we mess up, you know where we are working really hard and trying really hard, you know where we're tired, you know where we fall short, you know what's being done to us or said about us, and Lord, your heart for us is love, your heart for us is mercy, your heart for us is grace. So Lord, we tell you the truth, Lord, where we sin, we don't want to carry that in we want, we want your forgiveness. We want, we want your cleansing. And Lord, where we just simply can't do it anymore, Lord, we need your strength. Lord, you understand us. You know what our limits are. And Father, where we are wondering, where we have questions, where we don't have the answer, Lord, we pull in close to you because you do. And it's not even that you have to tell us the answer. You are our answer. You are our way. So, Lord, I pray your peace. I pray for the anxiety to bow to Jesus. I pray for the weariness the tiredness to be filled with strength. I pray, Lord, for your balm, your healing touch to be where we are hurting. Lord, some of our hurts are very deep. We don't even know how you could heal. But Lord, you are the healer. And so we ask to, to, to touch, to breathe on, to minister to. And Lord, that you, the one who is perfectly faithful, that you will cover us and shelter us during the storm, during the trouble. So thank you for your presence, Lord, today. Thank you for meeting each one of us exactly where we are. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That was a great song. Yesterday, now, and forever, always. He's the same. He's the same. Well, so it's a small group. I feel silly using a microphone, right? <laughs> But that's okay. A um, few announcements that we have. Um, for giving. That's the right one to get there. There we go. Ways to give. You can give online. Um, 
uh, using the QR code, or you can go to um, adelantofoursquarechurch.com, you can go to journeyfoursquare.com, journeyfoursquarechurch.com, all those websites belong to us, and uh, there's a giving link on the bottom of the main page, and this is just the way um, that we do the work of God in our community and do ministry in our church. There's also the offering box there against the wall. So some other reminders about this week. Men's Step Study, Monday, 7.15 p.m. Woo and uh, the guys are going through the Celebrate Recovery Step Study. Um, great things are happening with that, work, with, with that group of guys. Pastor Nate is leading that. And um, next announcement. Celebrate Recovery Wednesday, dinner at 545. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to Kendra, Anita, Kenny, people who are faithfully serving. It's been really awesome because we have a group of women that show up every Wednesday night, and God is doing a great work. And we have some guys that come, too. So, so invite family and friends to come on out. And we also have collecting recycling so we we kind of are missing that whole back to school thing which is okay yes. we're gonna look forward to the holiday season and doing an out community outreach um, so if you want to be a part of that we would like a team of people to come together to help plan that and put yeah. that together yeah. and, uh, and so we have some ideas but we're looking for, for a group of people who want to be a part of ministering to our community. Um, so when I get back from uh, Hawaii, which is not a vacation, <laughs> um, we'll have a meeting and we'll, um, we'll, we'll start uh, seeing what God wants to do Amen. Um, in, in the community here in the holiday season. Also, prayer for George School. Woo! We gave little uh, little treat packets to the teachers. We pray. We did prayer walks last year, um, and so meeting at Marconi Park Friday, September eighth, from ten to ten thirty. Miss um, Kendra, you can see her about that. And uh, we just this is a time we pray over the staff, the students, the families. Um, if you can't make it, it is okay. Praying between those same times at your home for whatever reason is just as powerful. We're all yeah. just united in prayer. Okay, yeah. so from 10 to 10.30. Yeah, so anyways. And then also coming soon, Operation Christmas Child. We are going to be again. So lots of different ways that we do this. Um, we will have some um, gift suggestions, but the shoe boxes get sent overseas to mostly third world countries where they just have like nothing. And these shoe boxes are packed with little toys, little um, gifts that, and there's there's lists of things like we can't send liquids over there. So like no bubbles, no, you know, things like that. Face. No toothpaste. No <laughs> but there, you know, dollar store, Walmart dollar section, Target dollar section. Um, uh, we have lists of things that work and for different age children, and you fill up a shoe box, um, and then we collect those, and we send, send them to the big distribution center, and they all get sent overseas. So anyways, that's coming soon. So you can do your own shoe box, or you can just bring some items. If you want to just bring pencils, or erasers, or socks, or- The box will be out there. Yeah, the, we'll have a collection box. Or if you want to just donate money, that's another way to do it, um, and I think maybe this year we'll maybe we'll have a shoebox packing party because that's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so be thinking about that, praying about how you can be a part of that. So if you go to Hobby Lobby or Walmart, they actually have like you can order things online. You can go to the stores and they have little signs and find items specifically for it that are on their list. So anyways, that's coming soon. And then also um, just keep praying for uh, disaster relief in Hawaii. We also want to pray for what's happening in Canada. Um, my cousin's pastor for Square Church up there, and they literally, like, there's so many evacuees.
evacuations happening. They ran for their lives. Their people are running for their lives. And um, the my cousins were like, if you need to put up a tent in our backyard, you're welcome to do that. Fires so um, anyways, we're going to we're gonna pray for that in a minute. But um, just keep that in prayer. And uh, we took a special offering last week, so we'll be sending some a special gift into disaster relief above our normal giving to help with the work that's being done there. And we're sending a person. <laughs> Amen. Go send me. I oh, have an right. offering. Send. <laughs> that is how we also contribute to missions, is by doing this, they're able to support others around the yeah. world, wherever they're at. Yeah. So you may not go, but you help. Um, I, I think that's it. Um, yeah, that's your name, we appreciate it. But let's pray. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, we lift up the people of Maui. We also lift up the people in Canada. Lord, I know that Spain has bad fires right now. There's just so much happening. Um, we ask for your presence, for your comfort, for your provision and protection over life. Um, Jesus, we also pray for Southern California um, from the bad weather that's happening. We just ask, Lord, we pray for our community where we know streets are flooding. Lord, would you intervene and as the creator and as almighty God, Lord, would you just put your hand to mediate from there being disaster or bad situations happening, Lord, because of the weather. Lord, let the ground be able to take in and drink in the water um, without the flooding, Lord, uh, that there would be no destruction, no loss of property or life, Lord, we just pray. Thank you, Lord. We open our hearts to your word today as Pastor Nate preaches. We ask you, Lord, that you speak to us personally because your word is living and active. And you are an alive God. You're, you're the one true real God. And we want to hear from you today, Lord, because we need you and we love you. So we honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Amen. Pastor Nate. Hurricane Hillary Faithful here today. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. So it's good to see you all, even though it's not a lot of us. Um, thank you all for coming. Praise the name of Jesus. Hey, uh, I don't know if you noticed uh, Pastor Christie's uh, red Foursquare disaster relief shirt. We're literally leaving from service to the airport and sending her to Maui. You know, we talk about our time, talent, our treasure. Uh, Christy, Pastor Christie is donating her talent. To the effort that's going on in Hawaii right now and in, on the island of Maui. And uh, it is actually not awesome what's going on to those families over there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff not in the news that's actually very terrible. And uh, we ask for your prayers for families, um, their entire families that are gone. And um, we ask that you lean in with your prayers. So praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise his name. So we are still in the book of James. And uh, it's pretty it's pretty fantastic. So right now we're going to talk about, we're only going to be in three verses today. And uh, and we I'm going to I'm going to have some references there. I've, I've handed out uh, sheets to everyone. I handed out sheets to everyone, uh, so you can you can uh, follow along with the reading. But what I would really like is you actually crack open your Bibles and uh, investigate this word more thoroughly. I want you to eat the meat and, uh, of the word. You know, let it nourish your souls as food nourishes our bodies. You know, I tell people, don't take my word for it. Pastor Christy and I don't say it over and over again. Don't take our words for it. Go to the source. Don't listen to what people are saying online. Don't listen to what people are saying on TV. If you want to know what God said, come right here. Amen. It'll tell you what God said. <laughs> Bible's weird like that. <laughs> 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 so, uh, 
So where we're starting is James chapter 1. We're going to talk about verses 9 and 11. And it's going to be a counterpoint. You see, leave right there. It's going to be a counterpoint between what the world calls rich and what God considers wealth versus poverty. And what does that look like? What does that mean? So I'm going to start right off by reading the word. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls away, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So, if you just read, the, if you just skim the surface of that, it sounds like, yeah, poor people win in the end. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's not actually James's point. And uh, the more you kind of dive into it, 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 it becomes a harder and harder read. You know? Um, so, you know, just to recap, uh, for, for those who this is the first time jumping in with us, James is the actual half-brother of Jesus. But he wasn't one of the apostles, because while Jesus was on earth, he was one of those guys in Galilee. It's like, I watched this guy grow up. I watched this guy break mama's window. I ain't, I'm, I'm, he ain't the Messiah. <laughs> they didn't have windows back then. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being metaphorical. But um, the thing is, it was after Jesus' resurrection. And Paul says this. Paul actually documents this in Galatians. It was after Jesus' resurrection that James came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So, you know, what we're doing today is, we're, so remember, for context, we're coming right off of Pastor Christie's message last Sunday, where we need to ask God for wisdom in all that we do. So keep that in mind. We are just coming off of asking God for wisdom in all that we do as we start talking about Having, uh, having pride in humble circumstances. So, starting with verse 9, it, it, humble circumstances, in the context of James, it refers to being materially poor, but that's not actually the focus. So, the point that James is making is to have, having spiritual wealth is more important than having material wealth. You know, uh, King Solomon was the richest man documented in the Bible, but in Proverbs 22, 4, he said, Sorry. That's done. 22, 4, right? Proverbs 22, keep going. Uh, you mean not Proverbs 22, 4? Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry about that. So, Proverbs 22, 4, Pastor's not keeping up. The rewards of humility and the fear of the Lord are wealth and honor and life. So King Solomon, the richest person documented in the Bible, he learned really early on that having all the money in the world didn't actually make him happy. In fact, the richer he got, the more problems he had. And by the time he writes Ecclesiastes later in his life, he makes a big point of saying, all of this is vain. And I'll let you look that up separately. Uh, but please, <laughs> and that means you're going to have to read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. See, so I'm sending you away with homework. Um, so the key is the posture of your heart, not simply being poor. See, being poor doesn't get you to heaven. And being rich doesn't keep you out. See, and um, that's something we need to keep in mind. You know, just because your life's hard doesn't mean you suddenly deserve to go to heaven. And that's something we need to keep in mind. See, what James is saying to take pride in your high position, he's saying that from the context of he is writing this to Christian believers. So this isn't a gospel. That's an important point. James is not writing a gospel. The gospel is the good news that you give to unbelievers. James is writing to the church saying, hey, y'all, this is how you keep it together. So.
So your high position is your faith in Jesus, not the fact that you're poor. See, because there's a difference between being poor and having a poverty mentality. And I got a newsflash for you. You've heard me say this in previous sermons. Having a poverty mentality has nothing to do with how much money you have. There's people out there who make millions upon millions upon millions, and they get so afraid of how people see them because they don't want to be perceived as poor that they go crazy buying all of these crazy things, trying to prove to the world how rich they are because they never lost that poverty mindset. And then they start worrying about how much they have, needing more, needing more, because you know what? Any minute now, I could lose it. Whereas if you have a spirit of wealth that comes from God, you become generous. And you're not worried about where your next dollar comes from. Or if it may not come. Because your, your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Not from anything you're doing in your own strength. See, so, let's put some context. You know me, I'm a context guy. I like to read the Bible, not just for what it's trying to teach me, but for what it was saying to the first century Christians who were reading this in real time. So in the first century, being poor was was kind of situation normal. Almost everybody was poor. You know, where you slept, what you were going to eat that day, was a day-to-day -day thing that you were worried about. You know, poverty and food insecurity were a real thing for most people every day. So people who were materially wealthy were considered to be blessed. Well, God must be watching out for him, because look at all the sheep he's got. Look at all the lands he has. Look at the nice place he lives. God must have put his hand on it. So Jesus actually <coughs> flipped that right on its head, and it was a really radical thing to say in the first century. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23, 24. I'm only going to display chapter 20, uh, verse 24, but read what? Well, you know what? I'll actually read it. I got it right here. <laughs> Matthew 19. Matthew 19, and we're talking about verses 23 and 24. Okay. Got it right here. Got then it. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This was hard stuff. I mean, we look at it now, and it's like, yeah, you see rich people messing up on TV all the time. But in the first century, this was a radical thing to say. Rich people honestly believed they were blessed. And poor people honestly believed rich people were blessed. So when Jesus turned that on its head, everyone that was just one of many things Jesus said that everybody's like, Wait a minute, what? So, think about it. <laughs> he literally says, I'll say it again. Meaning he had to say it more than once for people to get it because he knew this is hard stuff. <laughs> so, what this means for rich people, I'm going to talk about in a minute. But let's, let's focus right now on what this means to people who are not rich. You know, like me. <laughs> and like just about everybody here. Um, your high position, like I was talking about, is based first on how God sees you. Not on how you see yourself. That's important. You may not see yourself as rich. But you're looking at yourself through these eyes. You know, God sees you with an eternity mindset. And in his eternity mindset, you're his baby. You know, it's easy to look at rich people and be impressed in what they have and what they can do from their own means. 
what they have in society, the fancy cars they drive, the multiple cars they drive, the giant 12 car garage, you know, you know. But here's the thing, that stuff doesn't mean anything to God. It means nothing. Solomon said it best, all is vanity. All is dust in the wind. Those are the actual words that he uses. All is vanity, all is dust in the wind. Amen? Amen. See, so your high position that James is talking about, you are actual daughters and sons of the Most High King. He who has cattle on a thousand years. You are heirs to eternity. Ephesians 1. I want you guys to read this. And Pastor Christie's actually doing a study on this. Ephesians 1, that entire chapter is a checklist an inventory of how God sees you. Amen. Read it. It goes right. You are called. You are chosen. You are the elect. You are grafted in. You are adopted. He just goes on and on and on. You're mine, baby. That's what God's telling you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, when is the last time you looked at yourself as God's actual baby. Did you know you can pray to God like that? Everybody talks about, you know, oh God, this is so hard. Please help me. Oh God, this is so hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. God knows that. Hey, Dad, help me out. Amen. Literally. You're not being disrespectful. He's your dad. He loves you. I mean, he gets on his knees and puts his face down, loves you. Loves you. And he wants you to hang out with him. Verse 10 doesn't get any easier. So, James. Yeah. I mean, I'll even go right back and read just verse 10, just so we can. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. Sounds a lot like King Solomon. But wait, pride in their hum humiliation, what does that even mean? You know? Why would, I, why would I take pride in being humiliated? Once again, we're forgetting. The book of James is not talking about us versus them. James is writing this to Christians. So he's talking to rich people who are saved. And what he's reminding people who are wealthy is that you need to not take strength in your own wealth. You are to humble yourselves because you are exactly the same amount of saved as that poor guy over there. You're not more saved. You're not better to Jesus. You don't get us. You don't get to hop the line. You didn't get the Disney Park Pass that puts you up front. In fact, you're probably going to be behind the line of a lot of poor people who did a lot more for the kingdom than you did, because as it turns out, God doesn't need your money. So, that's not bad, though. I need us to focus on it. It's not bad to be materially wealthy. Because society likes to, there's a lot of stuff going on right now where people are like, rich people need to pay their fair share, and this, that, and the other, la, la. And you know what? That's true. But your fair share doesn't just come from what you have in your pocket. It's your time, your talent, and your treasure. Treasure being the last word. How much are you giving of yourself? How much time are you giving God? How much time are you spending hanging out with your dad that loves you? With the Jesus that died for you before you knew it? and just wants to hang out with you. Died for you not because he was doing the 
this gigantic thing for the whole world, which he was, but for you, for me, for Nate, for Christy, for Kenny, for Miss Bubble. Jesus died for Miss Bubble. Amen. 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 For you. That's right. For you personally. Yeah. Like you are the only person in the world. He loves you like you're the only person in the world. Kendra, he loves you like you're the only lady in the world. Ooh. Yeah. So, that also includes the people on TV, the people that don't like look like they deserve it, the people who don't look like us, the people who don't smell like us, the people we don't like, the people that hurt us, everyone. See, because newsflash, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's everyone, including the people we don't like. And sometimes that's hard, because this lady hurt me so bad that, Lord, she doesn't deserve to go to heaven. Because she hurt me, God, and if she goes to heaven, that's not fair. You see, that's a me mindset. That's a I blink of a life in the face of eternity mindset. Oh, look at you, Miss Bubbles, come on up here. She's like, yeah, the, how, can I repeat that? I'm gonna repeat that. Miss Bubbles is preaching tonight. She said, she said, yeah, we look at what they did to us, but what did you do? That's courtesy of Ms. Bubbles. I'm gonna give her a nickel bit. <laughs> See, what, so that doesn't mean, him saying that Jesus died for us doesn't mean everyone goes to heaven. Newsflash, that is not a get out of jail sticker. Sin doesn't keep, Pastor Gunther said this a few weeks ago, sin doesn't keep us from heaven, pride does. See, pride in our thinking that we're somehow good enough to not need Jesus to go to heaven. We did all the right things. We put just enough money in the tithe box. You know, our bad is not as bad as our good is good, so we should be okay. <laughs> you didn't do anything to deserve to go to heaven. And that's okay, because neither did I. You know, our lives are fine as it is right now. Look at how good I'm doing. Yeah, Jesus is like, all right. You know, that and a dollar will buy a cup of coffee, but not at Starbucks. Oh. See, and sometimes pride will take a different form. See, shame is kind of like the dark mirror image of pride, where we think we're so bad, have screwed up so much, that Jesus can't, Jesus is not, you know, all those other guys may be going to heaven, but I just got too much of the wrong tats, and I got this something thing on my face, and I've got these stars over here, and I hate the world, and hate, and hate, and hate, and hate, so I guess I'm not going to heaven. Wrong! The same one drop. The same one drop takes you down. Amen. See, I'm, not, I'm a pastor now. I wasn't always a pastor. And Pastor Christie remembers me telling her with tears on my face that, you know, um, yeah, I know the same one drop saved every one of us, but sometimes, you know, some people Jesus needed to take a scrub brush. And I felt like I was one of those. <laughs> that poor bristle brush. <laughs> See, Miss Kendra knows. Steel wool. <laughs> steel, steel wool, Miss Kelly. <laughs> but see, the thing, right. the Scotch right Ow. Praise the Lord for Scotch. Yeah, but Pastor, uh -huh. Chris, Pastor Christie remembers me crying about that. I actually had tears in my eyes thinking. You know, I was not as awesome as I would like to have been. And uh, same drop of blood. One drop. This time. So another kind of pride, and we see this a lot today. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me how to live. I do what I want. I'm fine. I'm happy. You know, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I don't need anybody's help. OK, 
okay, you know what? You might be happy, but do you have joy? See, because happiness and joy are not the same thing. Mm. Our joy comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. See, happiness is a product of our circumstances. So when our circumstances go south, we're not happy anymore. We get mad, we get angry, we start blaming other people because it can't possibly be my fault. You know, it's just not fair. We need to be mad at that guy. We need to be mad at those people. We need to be mad at that group of people who made our lives miserable. We need to be mad at that politician or this politician. You know what? Paul teaches us joy can take place in the midst of suffering. Because happiness comes from our circumstances, but joy comes from And we find peace, not in our circumstances, but in the eternity that awaits us. Because our eternity doesn't start when we die. When we die, it's just a transition. Our eternity starts from the day we're saved. And while we're still here, our job, our biggest job, our most important job, isn't what we're doing for this company, isn't what we're doing for this person, or that place, or what we own, or whatever. Our job is to spread the gospel, to let other people know. Fallen, broken believers saving fallen, broken people so they can learn how to save fallen, broken people because Jesus is sitting there looking at his dad going, just one more soul, dad. Just one more. So verse 11 gets to the point. I'm going to read verse 11, and then I'm going to hop to a different spot. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls away, and its beauty is destroyed, even while they go about their business. And for context, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. This is Paul writing to Timothy, who's a young man that Paul sent to be a bishop. Now, it's not like, you know, the modern day where we like to say the abyss, bishop, evangelist, this guy, that guy. Bishop is just like a leader of churches in a city. And that's it. Command those who are rich in this present world to not be arrogant. Huh? Nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Amen. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And it goes on to talk about treasures in heaven versus treasures in earth. But that's a message for another day. But please read it. See, so the sun rises with scorching heat is like those times people get hard. See, we're really going to, I'm going to touch a nerve today. Everybody fasten your seatbelt. Put your tomatoes away because I don't feel like getting hit again. <laughs> so it's like those times people get hurt. The times things get hard. See, people with means and ability have problems too, not just poor people. When I say poor people, let's really throw some context in. You guys ready? Yeah. See, here's what here's where this really sets down in, in where we live here in America. Okay? In this country, we feel poor because we're always trying to watch TV. I mean, we're watching TV and we're watching, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians and McGregor and all these people who drive all these fancy cars. I got my Monday Bentley and my Tuesday Bugatti. And you're like, man, why can't I live like that? I want a Bugatti. I don't well, I actually want a Bugatti. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, want <Lego. laughs> I want Lego Bugatti. Have you seen that? Look that up. Anyway. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. Here's the car. Did you eat today? Yeah. Do you have a place to live? That's keeping the rain out? 
Okay. Because if you have those two things, you're not poor. Mm. Let me tell you why. The poverty line in America, if you look this up, always check past me. The poverty line in America is $14,580 a year per person, which averages out to $39.94 a day. If you, if you don't have that, you're poor in America. That's poor. Well, that's me. <laughs> right on. I got it. But here is perspective. Who's ready? I'm ready. 85% of the world, 85% of the world subsists on less than $30 a day. 85%. 47% of the world lives on less than $6.85 a day. That is considered extreme poverty. So we're talking about that same equivalent, which means you can't say, well, because they live in this country, that's actually a lot of money. <coughs> no, it's still terrible because we're talking about the average equivalents for wherever you live. So that means 47% of the world lives in extreme poverty, which means daily food insecurity, daily housing insecurity. 14% of the world lives on less than $1 a day. So, not my notes, I'm gonna give you some real life. There's a time in my life, uh, due, to, due to the kind of work I used to do, uh, I was in a country that, I'll let you look up in the news, there's a lot of turmoil going on in that country today. But there was a time in my life I was there for four months. And we were very close within daily eye shot of a town that was uh, so unbelievably destitute that you couldn't really, there was no context. They had uh, no roofs on, on their houses because they had no material for them. We were in the middle of the desert. And they, the town existed around this spring. And they didn't even have the means to leave where they were because the nearest town was two to three hours away by vehicle and none of them had vehicles. So we're talking about days walking through the desert. So if they would have attempted to leave, they would have died. And um, the only thing keeping them alive was that spring. If that spring would have dried up, the whole town would have died because they were too far away to get somewhere else. And they'd been there generations. No time is measured for how long that little town had been. So they have existed like that for possibly centuries. And there was nothing we could do about it because why we were there had nothing to do with that. And to talk any more about that would be beyond the context of what we're saying today. But the point is, we in America have no context, no frame of reference for what poverty really looks like. And when you finally stare at it in the face, I'm not talking about you know, looking at something on TV that makes you sad or whatever it is, but being four months immersed in the kind of poverty that your mind can't even wrap itself around changes your perspective. Fourteen percent of the world is one billion people. Just so we're tracking. One billion people in the world live. Math doesn't lie, as it turns out. So why do I say this? When the scorching heat comes, what do you do? Do you reach out to Jesus or do you reach for your checkbook? And when you know the bank's car, when the bank's low, do you reach for your credit card? Because you know what? In two weeks, I'll have this. God's got me, even though you're not talking to him, because I got this credit card, I got this credit card, I got this credit card, and I got this much money in the bank. So I'm not going to talk to Jesus about my problems. And then when the cards max out, the 
the bank account goes dry. Now, all of a sudden, we're like, Jesus, I don't know what I'm going to do. Lord, please help me. And you know what? Jesus was right beside you the whole time saying, baby, why didn't you come to me two weeks ago? Baby, why didn't you come to me two months ago? And he's not even telling you like in this scolding way. He's like, baby, I'm right here. Jesus is not waiting for your problems to be insurmountable to come get you. You can tell him the smallest, silliest things. Lord Jesus, I just got to Walmart. Help me find a good parking spot. Okay, baby. Literally like that. Ask Master Chrissy. I noticed yesterday. <laughs> it was Target, but I mean, same thing. <laughs> or it's hard J. <laughs> Only because Walmart didn't have what we did because we went to Walmart. Yeah, we went to Walmart first. Okay, to the report, we went to Walmart first, but I, I, I don't want this video to get blocked because we're commercial. Tell <laughs> the truth. Okay, so the point is. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma go ahead. Sometimes. I'm going to repeat it in case the camera don't hear. Sometimes. Go ahead. I'm just going to repeat it for the camera. Ms. Bubbles wants to know why people don't talk to Jesus when they, when, when they don't need it. Meaning like, why don't you come to Jesus when you still got that money? Right. And why you wait to not have money? Because you would be amazed. Jesus might have a plan C or a plan K or a plan something to solve that problem. You always need a solution. You, Ms. Kelly says you always need it. So you should be... Good no. old Yeah, I don't understand it either, Ms. Bubbles. I don't. See, the thing is, put your hope in God. Put your trust in God. Always. You would be amazed what God has for you. I mean, you guys have heard our testimony. I'm just going to say it real fast. We had no idea how we were going to fix the roof. So here, here's where Pastor Nate and Pastor Christy need some help, you know. So we were like, you know what? We don't know what we're going to do about the roof, so we can't worry about the roof. So, Lord, if you just gave us the money to fix the roof, Lord, just give us the money to fix the roof. And somebody gave us a very large anonymous donation. And we were like, yes, we have the money to fix the roof. Woo, thank you, Jesus. You're so awesome. <laughs> and then we went to go get estimates on fixing the roof because we got the money now. We're not going to ask when we don't have the money. Now that we got the money, we're going to ask. And then the roof estimates were insane. So it's like, oh, actually, we don't have the money. Because <laughs> they're asking for three times what we have in our hands. And what we have in our hands is more than we've had in a year. So, okay, I don't know what we're going to do. And you know what? Pastor Christy jumped into the deep end of the pool. And she said, you know what, Jesus? This is not a money problem. This is a Jesus problem. And Lord, we have too many things we want to do for our community. We have this gift that we can pour back into the community. And Lord, I don't think it's your heart to spend it on the roof. Because if I spent this on the roof and dropped it on credit and got a loan and all this other stuff, I don't think our church could faithfully pay that back. So Lord, we have too many things we're doing for the community, so the roof is going to be your problem. So Jesus, we changed our prayer. We no longer said, Jesus, give us the money to fix the roof. We said, Jesus, fix the roof. And he did. He did. We had, didn't see it coming. Jesus did that plan J. Plan G. Plan Jesus. And uh, we got notification. To make a long story short, the entire roof repair was going to be paid. Mm -hmm. Didn't see it coming. So the gift that we were going to dump into the roof, we instead poured into our ministry. And what great blessings came from that. So, here's the thing. The book of James is telling us, as
as Christians how to live. But in order to start taking that in, as Christians, we have to receive the gospel. The gospel is the good news. That we don't have to live this way. We don't have to have a poverty mindset. We don't have to be rich and worry about these material things of the world. We can be materially wealthy and spiritually wealthy. Because Jesus died for all of us. He wants to be for us and with us in all our problems. Poor people problems, rich people problems. Jesus wants to be right there, like Ms. Bubble said. <laughs> Don't wait till you run out of money. Call him right now. Right now. Because Jesus loves you. And he wants to be in your mess, in your imperfection, in your tattoos and big hoop earrings and all that other stuff right now. No matter how big or how small your problem is. Amen. Amen. Yes. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for having come to save us. Thank you for having come to be with us. Lord, thank you for being interested and pulled in to all of our problems. Not just the big ones, but small things like where we're going to park and having the right thing we need to take on this trip. And Lord, I ask you to watch over Pastor Christy, who is, as, these, as uh, the disaster in Maui continues on, she is actually donating her time and her talent to be hands and feet. So Lord, I ask that you take her safely to Maui and then bring her safely back to me. Because she's my best present that you ever gave me, Lord. So Lord Jesus, watch over our church. Lord, let Hurricane Hillary blow itself out and let us be supernaturally surprised on how little it does here because your hand is in all things. Lord, watch over all our families that couldn't make it today. Lord Jesus, I ask that you be before us and beside us. Lord, I ask you to take this word, your word, and Lord, let it rest deeply in our hearts, and let us nourish our souls as food nourishes our bodies. And Lord, as we close in prayer, I ask, Lord, may you bless us and keep us. May you shine your face upon us. May you raise your countenance to us and be gracious to us. And Lord Jesus, give our church family peace in these troubled times. Name your son, Jesus Christ, I thank you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we as a church family say, Amen. Amen.